Hi, everyone. Welcome to the timingresearch.com Analyze Your Trade, episode number 136 for August 18th, 2020. Uh, we are recording this at 4 p.m. Eastern. My name is David Cosmeter, and I'm the creator of timingresearch.com. And today I arranged for Carly Gardner to be our guest, and you should be seeing her screen right now. And uh, so we're going to see how... Uh, She's going to show us how she how she trades today. So the option professor is back to moderate, and I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to him. Sounds good. Okay, uh, Carly, good to have you with us here today. Thank you. Good to be here. Yep. There's a lot of people who um, are aware of you because obviously you've been on uh, financial TV being interviewed and stuff like that before, uh, Bloomberg, CNBC, et cetera. But for the new people who might not be familiar, could you give a little background on yourself and what your company does? Sure. So my name is Carly Garner. We are uh, a futures and options brokerage service. We're located in Las Vegas, Nevada. It's a lot sunnier here than in Chicago. That's where most commodity brokers reside. Um, we offer everything from discount online trading to full service. So we're not unlike some of the, like a lot of people haven't, um, well, let's just put it this way. Most traders are trading with the big houses. The, uh, I don't really want to mention names, but you know, you know who they are. The brokerages that everybody's heard about, those brokerages tend to focus on stocks and then they offer commodities as kind of a signed product, but it's not what they do. We're the opposite of that. We only offer commodities, so it is what we do. Great. And of course, the sector of commodities and futures certainly have had a big year since the March uh, drop. So we'll get into all that uh, in a minute here. Um, there are a lot of uh, different stocks that have been put down today, but we're going to try to stick with the ones that you'd be more familiar with. And um, let's start out with the VIX. Um, v, they're looking at VXX, but which one do you okay. trade on the futures? So let me see if I can pull this up here. Can everybody see this if I use a web page? Or do I need to change my share? Here, let me change it. Okay. Uh, Okay, yeah, there it depends you go. on. You okay, see? yeah, we. Okay, can see perfect. Them. Okay, I wasn't sure how that would work. Okay, so um, this is a, a VIX futures chart, just using the front month. It's a continuous. To be to be honest, the VIX is a really, the VIX is a weird product. Like we mm -hmm. tend to focus on option trading, and if we are trading futures or at least recommending our let let me just put this out there before we get go any further. Our brokerage clients are free to trade whatever they want, any strategy they want. So just because I recommend something doesn't mean that's what they're going to do. So when I say we, I'm not saying, uh, I'm not insinuating that everybody's trading that. It's just, that's just the easiest way to, to say it. But so anyway, a lot of the recommendations that we put out um, are option based, or if they are futures, they have some sort of option hedge. So with that said, the reason I'm even bringing that up is VIX futures don't have options listed against them. It's confusing because there are VIX options, but those are stock products, not futures products. Most people don't understand that. So if you're going to trade VIX in the futures market, it's literally you're either uh, all in on the futures or you're out. There's no way to hedge it with options. So it makes things a little bit uh, difficult, especially with the margin uh, running. Let me just see what it's running here. And of course I clicked on the wrong one. Uh, sorry about that. So VIX is about 14,000 in margin. So as you can imagine, not everybody wants to trade a product that has that high of a margin requirement. Although the S&P actually has that high of a margin requirement almost at this particular moment, but it's not common. Uh, but the thing is the VIX is really, it's a really risky product on the future side. For every point it moves up or down, you make or lose a thousand bucks. So. It's something that most people probably should stay away from as far as trading, but as far as watching it, I think it's very important to watch it. We're watching uh, the $20 level in the VIX. My personal opinion is that could be where we kind of make or break the market. If the, if the mm -hmm. VIX falls below 20, mm -hmm. the stock market will probably just continue to melt up. Obviously they kind of work inverse of each other, but I think that'll just take a lot of the bearish sentiment out of the market. Believe it or not, even though the stock market's sitting near all-time highs, most people are bearish. If you look at the COT report, most speculators are short, not long. So mm -hmm. it's kind of interesting. But if 20 holds in the VIX, we could get a little bit of a correction in the S&P. So that's kind of where our line in the sand is. Mm -hmm. Are you using any um, uh, Elliott Wave or Fibonacci numbers or anything like that during your analysis? 
Uh, you know, I mean, I, every, I'll occasionally glance at those things, but that's not mm -hmm. something that I really um, put a whole lot of emphasis into. Sure. All right. Well, um, there are different sectors on the futures. And again, uh, the, um, the futures as itself is a sector of itself. So a lot of people may have stocks and they have bonds and they have growth stocks and different things. So this is just an asset allocation section that we're going to cover today that, uh, you know, some people may be under, um, under informed on. So it'll be good. But uh, let's start out with uh, like they have GLD on the chart. So let's start out with the metals. How do we look okay. uh, for the gold right now? Okay, so I'm going to switch my share here. Go back to my platform. Participation here is definitely picked up. Huh? Yeah, for sure. I'm sorry about that. Uh, I have so many windows up. It's hard to, I think you can see the gold chart now. Okay. Let me, let me scrunch it a little. Okay. So everybody and their dog, and I'm not kidding, is calling me about trading gold. It's one of those things that uh, nobody wanted to talk about gold when it was at 1200 or 1100, but now that we're at 2000, everybody wants it. My personal opinion is they've probably missed the boat. Gold is a very um, emotional market and you know it, it runs on momentum, but when that momentum dries up, things get ugly. And that's been the case literally throughout the history of gold. So with my personal opinion is like, we've been calling for gold to possibly top out somewhere around like 2050, 2000 area to maybe 2250. And I know that's a really, really big range. If you happen to go short at 2000 and it goes to 2250 before it rolls over, you're in trouble. I get that. Mm -hmm. But that's just this kind of trying to pinpoint when and where gold's going to turn around is really a tough game. I've kind of told my clients that the goal in gold and silver at this point is just to not get run over. So make sure anything you've got on has some sort of risk mitigation um, in place. So for example, what we've been kind of pushing our clients towards, instead of trying to buy or sell futures or buy calls or puts, which are insanely expensive at this point, mm -hmm. We've been kind of encouraging them to do butterfly spreads. They're absolutely not perfect because butterfly spreads are basically range trades. Um, but the are you are you long? Are these debit? Are these debit spreads? Meaning uh, you are, are? Yeah. So you're looking to make the differential between the two strikes. Correct. Right. So the idea is um, on the on the upside, we played the call side, and to be honest, the market just kind of blew through a lot of them. Some of them did okay, but a lot of them gold moved too far too fast, which was, yeah. it's a bummer because we were right in the direction. The trade didn't pay off like we expected, although there's still some time left and I'm not, I wouldn't be shocked to see them fall back in gold, fall back into the range. But the problem with the butterfly is um, they're range trades. So like I said, if you're too right and the market blows above or below your range, you don't make any money, even though you might've been right on the direction. The other thing is, uh, you have to hold the expiration to really see your, your profit potential materialize. But with that said, you really can't get hurt too bad. So for example, we were putting together spreads on both the call side and the put side, depending on if people were looking for the upside or the downside. On Bloomberg, we actually did a trade. I think it was on Friday. We kind of gave an idea of a put spread. And the point of it is you're only risking like $400. And if it turns out you might make 4,500 to five grand. If it doesn't turn out, you're out 400 bucks. So that's the kind of positions that we would recommend in gold at this time. Anything more aggressive. Um, I mean, most people look at the chart and they want to be long or short. Most people want to be long. The reality is if you're a little early or a little late, you're going to get hurt pretty badly. Even if you're trading the micro futures, the nice thing about gold is there's multiple contract sizes. There's a mini, a full size and a micro. The micro is a little easier to manage. It's only 10 ounces of gold. So every dollar that gold moves up or down, you're making or losing $10 on the futures contracts. That's a little easier for people to stomach. But even with the micro, with these types of swings, you're seeing some pretty big moves. So. Yeah, I mean, it went from 2100 down to 1900, which is a 200 yeah. point move in like two days. So It did, yeah. And that was, yeah, that was, I mean, that's a huge flush out. In 2011, I kind of remember something similar happening where we had a big flush out. It came back, retested highs, or got near, and then it just kind of collapsed from there. Mm -hmm. uh, 
in the past, we've seen when gold does correct, it's usually 30 to 40%, not 10%. So I wouldn't be shocked to see gold trade back into the 1500s. Yeah. And of course, um, if you do end up being the owner of the old, of the high of the move, it can be many years before you get that money back. <laughs> right. Yeah. right. It, took yeah. 20, it took 27 yeah. years from the 80s to that. And then it just took yeah. 10 years almost from that. So. Yeah. And it's hard. I mean, even if you, if you bought in 2011 near 2000, sure, maybe you're, you're getting your money back now, but think of all the opportunities you missed out on in the meantime. And that's mm -hmm. assuming you were able to hold on. I can guarantee 95% of people liquidated at losses well before that they didn't wait it out and I can't blame them. Gold doesn't yeah. pay dividends. So let's turn to the silver and okay. uh, see if that uh, looks good. Cause uh, as I was watching it, as soon as it got above 19 or 20, it was kind of like a, a green light. It was. So um, let's see if I can size this right. It was, so, a green, it was a green light that a Ferrari went through though, huh? <laughs> right, it was. Yeah. So we were bullish on, we had been bullish on silver for quite a while. We've actually turned bearish. Our target on the upside was $30. So far that's holding. Now, um, obviously, this is a monthly chart, by the way. So this is kind of a bigger picture. It looks a lot tamer on this with this chart than it might a daily chart. This was far from a tame move. This was a really wild move. And again, you look at a chart and people assume that everybody must have made a bunch of money, but I can tell you it goes both ways. If you were mm -hmm. on the wrong side of that, that was pretty nasty. So again, we tell our clients this kind of stuff. We just want to survive and not get hurt too bad as opposed to try to get rich. Because if you're swinging for the fence in this kind of a market and your timing's off, you're going to be in trouble. Yeah, and the, the volatility and the swings are very, very wide at this point. You know, you can see how tight it was for a long time. Uh, right. But uh, once it broke out now, now the swings are, by definition, probably going to be wider. Huh? Right, yeah. So the same, we're doing the same, same things here where we're just kind of pushing people into option spreads. Of course, they have minds of their own. Some people want to be long or short futures, and that's fine. But just to give you an idea of if you're trading a full-size futures contract, it's 5,000 ounces of silver. And for every dollar silver goes up or down, you make or lose $5,000. So silver, just a few days ago, at one point in the session was down $4. So that's $20,000 per contract that someone made or lost. That's a lot of money and that's a pretty stressful trading yeah. environment. So, And it's probably outside the risk window of most traders. I would assume, I would assume so, yeah. And uh, I mean, on top of that, it's not even just the... Yeah. Anyway, it's it, that's a little tough to handle for even the, the big guys. All right. The last uh, metal, um, well, we go copper too, but um, I thought uh, that platinum may have the better value uh, if you look at a longer term graph because it's just beginning to come out of the chute 30 times rarer than gold. And uh, what do you think of platinum? Is there a value there? Um. To be 100% honest, I don't follow platinum nearly as closely just simply because mm -hmm. it's, thinner, it, yeah. it's thin. It's thin. And we, do, like I mentioned before, we do a lot of option trading. And so, yeah, you can't do it. Good, you just can't. You yeah. can't. Between so, the bid offers and the uh, and everything else, you, you could uh, have a hard time yeah. getting anything it's just, up. Yeah. Right. But let me pull up a chart. I mean, it's definitely behaving itself a lot more than the, than the other metals. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I can see that. But, um, like I'm the, with my personality, I'm like, I prefer to have hedges on and to make sure that there's some, a risk buffer in place. So platinum is just yeah. not the place for me. And you also, you know, there's enough headaches out there. You don't have to seek them out with illiquid markets, right? Well, that's absolutely true. Yeah. Do you do much with copper? We, we dabble with copper a little bit. We had a, a bear put spread on in copper that we had recommended a, a while back, which actually did... Uh, did pay off, assuming people liquidated a few days ago. But obviously, we're we're coming back up and retesting highs here in copper. Um, I personally think that the the currency markets are probably going to flip around at least temporarily here in the next month or so. And if that mm -hmm. happens, copper is going to have a hard time. So I'm thinking copper probably holds three dollars. It's we haven't seen copper above three dollars in a long time, and I'm not sure the world's ready for that quite yet. Yeah. Now you just mentioned something I think is very interesting and that's uh, on the foreign currency. Uh, the dollar index is like 60% uh, Euro. Why don't we look at the Euro? Cause it seemed like that 119, 120 might be the end of the run here, at least temporarily. Right. So I have a monthly chart up in the Euro. Now we've been bullish the Euro for quite some time. Uh, we were early, like really early, <laughs> but, but it finally did come around. 
at this point, I've, I'm no longer bullish. I'm actually pretty neutral. If you can see on a monthly chart, we're just kind of approaching, right, this general area. Hope, hopefully you can see that, that we're coming up against some resistance. So this is make or break. If the euro fails here, we probably just come right back down and start printing. I don't know if we'll see par. I doubt that, but we could definitely see 110 or a little below. But if it breaks above this, we could get something really big. And I know that what we've seen in the last month or two seems like a massive move, but if with this chart, this monthly chart, taking a step back, you can see the currency market volatility has actually been pretty pathetic compared to what we've seen in the past. So um, it'll be interesting to see what the Euro does with this. If it breaks up above 120, it could get a really massive uh, follow through. What makes me think that we're not gonna do that right away is if you look at speculators positioned, mm -hmm. they're, really long the euro and really short the dollar and usually with specs all good get on the same side of the bus things don't go as planned now uh, can you look at a shorter term graph and put some rsi on it and because uh, sure. we are just uh, testing the highs i was wondering yep. if there's any divergence at all so this is a daily chart and uh this this is the rsi up here i watch the rsi pretty closely so we're we're a little overbought on a daily chart um I also look at Bollinger Bands, which seem to be, we seem to be a little overdone in regards to those as well, so. Would you call that a little bit of a divergence in that we've just made a new high up there and that RSI is lagging just a bit? Yeah, or I that's would not say, enough, no, I think, I think that's pretty, honestly, in the RSA, you're probably not gonna get a whole lot more divergence than that. So mm -hmm. I think that's pretty, pretty telling. Um, again, you can see we're right up against 120. This will be a pretty significant level. I think it holds, but, only time will tell. Yeah, and if the RSI turned down from here and you broke mm -hmm. underneath maybe the 118 mark, that might be a signal that uh, it could roll over a little bit? I think so. I think we could be, um, overall, I wouldn't be shocked to see something down here in the 112s. We actually have a call butterfly that, again, kind of similar to metals, we were like, we were a little too right on it. We had established it quite a while ago. I think it's, if I remember right, it's the 115s and the 117s and the 119s. So our butterfly is, let me get that out of the way so you can see, our butterfly centers around 117. So um, if the market pulls back, we'll be in pretty good shape. But right now it's on the upside of our butterfly, so which is, doesn't do us any good. But that's kind of what we've been looking for is about 117 as an equilibrium, and then we'll see how it goes from there. Yeah. And the months of September and October could be key for a lot of these markets, huh? Yeah, I think it's going to be interesting, especially um, with, like I said, with the currency markets on the verge of rolling over, that'll really have a big impact in just about everything, commodities, stocks, not to mention the election that we've got coming up. That'll be right. interesting. Right. <laughs> well, we've got uh, the treasury bonds uh, got hit pretty good here from the 183 area down to 177 and change. Now they've bounced back mm -hmm. up. Do you have an opinion right. on the long bond? I do. So we follow the 10 year note a little more closely, but I, I mean, I do definitely watch the bonds. And so what I'm thinking here seasonally, what we tend to see almost every September is, at, I'm sorry, not September, August, as the September futures go into expiration, which this year it's going to be, I think, August 31st, I think is what I had saw. Basically, first notice days on August 31st. And usually what you see is as the September bonds and notes are going into expiration, the market squeezes higher into that time frame and then the december contract kind of rolls over and comes down so we're looking for the next couple of weeks to be supportive for treasuries but we'd mm -hmm. like to be, long term i'm bearish so i'd like to see if we're real lucky maybe we'll see 184 again in the third year we can uh, be pretty comfortably bearish from there but we'll have to see how it goes yeah and the 10-year note similar uh, pattern or uh, it is. So in the 10 year note, we'll be looking for somewhere around a little over 140 to 141. This is an interesting chart in the 10 year note. People tend to forget where we've been <laughs> and where maybe we could go. So, I mean, I know that everybody's been uh, bearish treasuries for as long as you could rem remember, and it hasn't really worked out. But the reality is, most of last year, we actually were bullish, but here I have to be highly bearish. I look at this monthly chart and I think, um, despite all the crazy fundamentals and the printing press at the Fed mm -hmm. and all those sorts of things, mm -hmm. the 10 year note is rarely, or in fact, it has not been able to hold an RSI this overbought. So 
we'll see what happens, but I'd say it's probably a better sell than a buy for the long run. Yeah, it seems like that 0. 0.50 is about all they can bring it down yeah. to for temporary time. I think um, right. There's a lot of activity in agriculture and um, it could be an exciting period or it could be a head fake. Um, and then I had a question for you on, um, some, somebody told me that there was a fire that affected the corn crop. I mean, can you fill in some gaps on what's going on in agriculture? Sure. So there was some weird, crazy weather pattern that, that caused some damage, to be honest. Um, from what I heard over the weekend, I expected it to get a, to give corn a bigger boost, but it didn't. And so I'm also hearing a lot of farmers are, you know, chattering and it sounds like maybe the damage isn't uh, nearly, isn't as bad as what some people are saying it is, but I, time will tell. What I do know is normally during this time of year, basically from late August through late September, the grains almost always go down because whatever weather event occurred or whatever the bad news that came out occurred, it usually fades and turns out everything's just fine. So I wouldn't be aggressively short the grains just because to be honest, they're kind of, they're on the cheap end of the, yeah, the spectrum. They're lower price, yeah, right. right. So, I mean, you don't want to get crazy. I wouldn't go yeah. sell corn and beans down here naked, but what we did today was we, we had some long corn calls coming into the session. We sold those and just got yeah. moved to the sideline and corn. And we bought some bean oil puts today the reason being they're crazy cheap. You can get a near the money put for 300 bucks and it, it either happens or it doesn't, but at least you have a little risk. And if, if it works out, you might make a little money. Yeah. If, if it unwinds, um, yeah. looking at the soy complex, um, how do you feel about soybeans? Cause they've been trading, you know, uh, they bottomed out at eight and then the next low was around eight twenty, then eight forty, then eight sixty, right. then eight eighty. So um, is it, is it building something or is it just really just uh, peeking its head out and then it's going to come right back in like groundhog day? <laughs> right. <laughs> so, uh, when I first started in this business, soybeans were, extremely volatile. Soybeans were basically like silver is now. I mean, mm -hmm. they were all over the place and they were pretty exciting and pretty scary to trade. Lately, soybeans has really been a sleeper for years. So it's, we're, we're due for some really big, massive rip your face off rally in soybeans. That said, I don't think it's going to be immediately, like I mentioned, the seasonals are pretty bare. So I would expect that these highs here will probably hold somewhere. 920, 930 is probably going to hold. I think we come back into the mid eights. I'd be bullish from there. And then we'll, you know, we'll see what happens. But normally this time of year, it's really hard for grain rallies to sustain themselves. Now you were, um, you're familiar with the seasonals. So your feeling on agriculture is generally the August, the September, October timeframe as we go into the November beans uh, is generally not that fabulous. Correct. Right. So basically from like mid to late August through late September is usually bearish for the grains. Now there's ex years that are exceptions. Some, maybe there's a drought or some weird thing that normally doesn't happen, but more often than not, that's exactly what happens. And then we tend to get what they call harvest lows in October, but anytime. Uh, so basically what, what we like to do, and again, seasonals are not perfect. They don't work no. every year. They work most years, but not every year, but we like to look for discounted grain markets in like mid to late September hoping for things to bottom out in October and then head higher into December. So you, you find uh, as we go into the end of the calendar year, it can be pretty good. And then um, how, how about the first half of the new year? What does that kind of seasonally say? Um, seasonally, the grains tend to stay relatively supported early in the year. Um, they, it's, it's actually pretty sluggish. I'd say that support is probably not the right word. It's probably a little sluggish the first couple, couple months of the year and then you start mm -hmm. seeing as we go into the spring when you know planting if something's going wrong with planting or something like that the grains start to firm up so the key is to really be you know you don't want to chase grain rallies that rarely works although it worked you know seven eight years ago we had some massive rallies that that worked in <laughs> but most of mm -hmm. the time it doesn't so the idea is you want to try to get get into grains on a, a dip. And one thing to keep in mind with, or, I'm sorry, with commodities, especially the grains is contango. Mm -hmm. So even if the price of corn um, is firming up in the cash market, that doesn't mean the futures isn't going to go lower. And that's because as we get basically contracts that are priced at, for expiration in the, in the future 
yeah. are priced higher to account for Contango, which is like storage costs and things like that. Mm -hmm. So Contango is always working against the bulls and it's always working in favor of the bears. So you want to just be mindful of that. Almost like time premium and a call option. Exactly. It, yep. It's the same idea. Yeah. But generally speaking, uh, Q4 can have a little bit of a bounce. Q1 might be dead. And then as you yeah. go into the spring planting season, it could get some legs at that point. It can. Yeah. Especially there's some USDA reports around that time of year that can make or break the market. And so it can get pretty, pretty hectic. But um, ideally, sometimes it's probably not a bad idea. Let's say that we do sell off in the grains here in the next month or two. It might not be a bad idea to just start putting some bull call spreads out there using like July expirations. It's a little further than what I would normally suggest doing, but in the grains, it kind of makes sense because mm -hmm. if you put a bull call spread in, which if you're not familiar with options, basically you're buying a call, uh, hopefully relatively near the money and then selling one out of the money to help pay for that. If you do that in the grains and let's say the grains continue to dribble lower for a few months after you get in, you could probably buy back your call and take a nice profit on that and then hold the long call and you, you help finance your trade. If it doesn't do that, it goes straight up. You probably pick up a little money on the spread anyway. With regards to weed, is there any opportunity there? Seems like it's stuck in that $5 all the time. It is. Oh, let me pull these. So we, we've had a couple vertical spreads that we've done in wheat and we've had a little bit of luck playing this range here. Um, doesn't mean that luck's going to last, but for now we're flat and I'm okay being flat. If we get back up to like 550, I'd like to probably play the downside, but here I probably wouldn't touch it either way. What are those um, lines? Those are just uh, trend lines that you've put together? The, um, the, the, the blue line. and these, yeah. the blue and red, this was part of our vertical spread. We had uh, somewhere around here, we had purchased a 520 put and sold a 480. When I send ideas out to my clients. I like to put uh, visuals on the chart so they can follow along. I guess I forgot to erase it, but so that's what that was. Those are just the strike prices of our option spreads. Well, with COVID and everything, everyone's going to the store a lot more than they used to. And some people are seeing uh, the price of meat and pork might be going up a little bit. Uh, you see anything in live cattle or lean hogs? So the th we're actually, we have put spreads on in live cattle, mostly because of this chart. This is a weekly chart and you can see we're up against the upper Bollinger Bands. Um, little overbought, not crazy overbought, but RSI is slightly elevated. Primarily we are, we have bearish spreads on in cattle because seasonally they tend to go lower this time of year. And also I'm not a, I don't like, I don't live and die by fundamental analysis, but fundamentals are pretty bearish. There's a lot of cattle out there, mostly because of the restaurants, first the shutdown and then now the mm -hmm. restaurants are open, but they're only at half capacity. So a lot of the meat going to the restaurants is, is just not being consumed like it was before. So there's a bit of an oversupply. So we're looking for cattle to go lower, but um, you're right. And it doesn't make sense because if you go to the grocery store, it's really expensive, but in the cash market and the futures market, it's actually kind of cheap. Now, some people have been telling me lean hogs have been a good place to be on the long side in the last month or two. Do you see that? I like the upside in ho hogs long term, but this is a this is a daily chart of December hogs, and you can kind of see we're we're really range bound, mm -hmm. and seasonally we do tend to similar to cattle we tend to go lower for the next couple of weeks. I will probably I'm hoping that we get down to this general level somewhere around 49 or so because I'd mm -hmm. like to play the upside, but I'd like to do it from that level hopefully. But the last month or so uh, there was a pop, huh? There was, yeah. So it went from like roughly 49 cents to 55 cents. I mean, it's a five or six cent move. Um, if you've ever traded cattle future, I'm sorry, hog futures, that's like 2,400 bucks per contract. So that's a pretty decent move. For a few weeks. Not yeah. too bad. Nope. Um, okay. People did have um, oil stocks like Chevron on their list. And it seems okay. like Chevron is trying to roll over. So let's look at crude oil and see if there's a reason why... Uh, Chevron could roll over even further or not. Mm -hmm. Okay, so crude oil has been, in March, it was off the charts wild, and now it's off the charts quiet. So we're just trying to figure out what's, what's next. Mm. Uh, personally, I think that we are due for a little bit of a correction. I think the, what we saw in March was it basically wiped out all the speculators. Like, People don't dare trade crude oil anymore, no, or at least think, not, no. yeah, not the way that they did before. So it's really calmed the market down quite a bit, but people are going to start, you know, they just can't help themselves. Crude oil is one of those markets that lures people in. 
and they're going to start looking at it again and it's going to start moving around again. I don't know exactly when, but probably sooner rather than later. You don't see crude oil trade this calmly for very long. Um, I, you can't even tell, but these are the Bollinger Bands. They're this tight. It's a uh, three, $3 range on the Bollinger Bands. That's insane. So I'm thinking crude's going to move over. This is a recommendation that we recommended to our clients. It was just a cheap way to get in. Buying the October 39 put, selling the 36 put. It's a $3 spread. Unfortunately, it's the market's trade sideways since we got into it. So the spread has lost value. But I think we got into it for about 65, 70 cents. So the most we could lose is 700 bucks, roughly. And if it goes well, maybe we can pick up about 2300. I got you. And um, with regards to crude, um, the red line comes in around 35 or so. Let's say uh, somebody was thinking next year, mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, obviously we normalize our uh, usage of everything. And, you know, the frackers are uh, beat up and the rig counts way down and OPEC sure. has been somewhat cooperative. So if people sure. thought they were going to see a 50 number next year, mm -hmm. would you be kind of looking to maybe investigate longs between 35 and 40? Yeah, sure. So, so we picked this spread because we think if it does correct, it's probably going to, the selling will probably dry up somewhere around 35, 36. I would absolutely be looking to play the other side if we get down to those levels. Cause I think um, long-term, I think crude oil's got, got some move, room to move on the upside. Yeah. Cause the demand looks like, I mean, people are all over the highways again. So. Oh yeah. It's we have traffic here in Vegas. So it's, yeah. it's not normal by any means, but it's, it's going. So yeah. Well, the other one I've been hearing on the street uh, that people have made money on in the last month or so is natural gas. How does that look to you? Okay. Because that was a good winner, I think, for the last month or so. Mm -hmm. yeah. So natural gas has had a really big run in the last uh, couple of weeks. And, you know, I don't, I'm not necessarily bullish from these levels. I think we've right. probably seen most of what we're going to see, but I'm not bearish mm -hmm. either. I don't think it's going to turn around and collapse because we're getting a lot of this boost from hotter than expected weather. Uh, but we have to also keep in mind, it doesn't seem like it, but the summer is actually coming to an end and the um, commercial users are going to start stockpiling or, or preparing for the winter season. And this, so this is generally when natural gas starts to go up anyway for getting prepared for the winter. So I think we'll probably hold these levels, maybe grind around a little bit, maybe even go a little higher. I wouldn't, wouldn't try to short it, but I think you probably missed the boat trying to play the upside. Yeah, I'm watching LNG, which is in the business of uh, natural gas, and it's lost about uh, eight or ten percent from the tie in the last few mm -hmm. days. So that's uh, that might be telling you something. Maybe not. It could. I've I'm not an expert on the ETFs by any means, but I have found they tend to between the rebalancing and those sort of things. There, it's not nearly as efficient as futures. Of course, it's a lot less uh, stressful as futures. Let me see if I can find the natural gas trade that we had done a while back. Here it is. Um, I think I have to reshare. Hold on a second here. Okay, hopefully you can see this. So this is a trade that we put on actually, uh, that we had recommended, I should say, to put on two months ago, maybe even, yeah, about two months ago. And it's a butterfly in natural gas. Usually you don't want to do butterflies with that much time left on them because as I mentioned earlier in the, in the webinar, butterflies, you kind of have to hold the expiration to really see what you're looking for just because of the way the time value on the options work. But we saw this opportunity. It was a really, really great way to get into natural gas with very little risk and a pretty good um, shot at making some money. So what we were doing was buying the November 250 call, selling two $3 calls and then buying a 350 call. The cost to get into the trade, if I remember right, was about seven or 800 bucks. Um, if natural gas is trading around $3 at expiration, it might pay off as much as five grand. So limited risk and an easy way to get into what's normally a, a wild market with uh, and, you know, still being able to sleep at night. You know, um, we were over on the US dollar and the British pound, uh, not excuse me, the uh, Euro, but mm -hmm. um, maybe you could help people like myself who are not that familiar with Bitcoin. I mean, let me just end some questions that I, as a experienced investor, you know, have. Um, okay. And what has kept me away from Bitcoin? Um, 
you know, who, who actually owns these Bitcoins and, and uh, who, like, do they take, do you, can you, like, in most futures, you can take delivery. Can you take delivery of Bitcoin on futures? Um, you cannot. I believe it's cash settled. It's been a little while. I apologize. I should yeah. know that. I actually have written articles on that and I can't, just off the top of my head, I can't remember. I'm pretty sure it's cash settled. Um, I find it to be mysterious yeah. and I wouldn't want to put it like, is. you know, uh, <laughs> Uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars into something and have no idea who owes me the money or where sure. the money is. And, you know, so I mean, right. I, but I, of course it's gone up to 12,000. So people who just got in the water right. and said, I don't even care if it's hot or cold, get me in, you know? Yeah. So here's the one thing I can say about Bitcoin is, uh, I mean, you can see on this chart, it's not the most liquid market in the world. You can see there's a lot of snow out here and, and it, it kind of lurches and that's because it's not liquid and it's ironic that it's not liquid because you hear about it all the time. So most people when they're buying or selling Bitcoin, they're doing it in the cash market. They're using uh, virtual wallets. I'm not an expert on that side of things, but it's basically uh, you're, there's a lot of counterparty risk. So like, as you mentioned, if you buy it and whoever you're trading with goes belly up or whatever, you're probably just out, out of luck. Your money's probably just gone. Here, we're talking about Bitcoin futures. That's the chart I have up as the Bitcoin future. The exchange does guarantee it. So you don't have counterparty risk. So that's a good thing. The bad thing is the margins are really high. It's volatile. And um, I mean, I haven't found a way to predict where it's going. I don't, maybe someone else has, but. <laughs> is it optionable? There are no options on it. Okay, so you just played a contract or you don't play at all. And let's right. say, you know, say you're just using the blue line for a moving average and you said, you know mm -hmm. what, I think it looks like a bargain here at 9,000. How much right. money would uh, initial be and uh, how much is each point going for or against you? Okay, so let me check the current uh, margin here. They've changed it quite a bit lately. Oh, I imagine. When it goes from 9,000 to 12,000, they're going to want a little bit more money. Huh? Sure. Particularly from those shorts. Uh -huh. Um, on a futuristic basis, I definitely see it because the millennials who are next to the next control group in the world are so savvy with these computers and, you know, uh, payment on the computer and, you know, everything you want, you order on the mm -hmm. computer. So, you know, the idea that they want their currency on the computer and not in <clears throat> this paper stuff or whatever, right. sure. um, it makes a lot of sense to me longer term. Right. So, okay. So here's the, the specs. So the, um, the margin is 22,000, which is a little mm -hmm. steep for most people. The contract value is 60,000. So just to put things in perspective, um, the margin is really, really high relative to contract value. So for example, in the even S and P your, the contract value is, um, like 150 grand. Yeah, there, thank you. I was having a brain for it. So yeah, it's about <laughs> 150,000 and the margin's only like 13 grand. So you can see there's so much more leverage built into the S&P than there is Bitcoin. And the reason being Bitcoin is just a little less trustworthy. People can get into more trouble. So the exchange isn't comfortable giving them that much leverage. Um, each tick is worth $25. So you can see how fast that would add up. Um, so basically, so, if it goes from 9000 to 10000 that's a $25,000 move on your twenty two grand you put down. Uh, yes, that sounds accurate, yes. Okay. So, so of course, if it goes 1000 against you, uh, you wiped right. out and uh, went deficit. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know? Yes, right. Yeah. Nobody wants that. No, no. Well, obviously, it's probably for larger institutions and stuff like that. Yeah, I think that uh, they used to, there, when it originally launched, there were different sizes and they were traded on different exchanges, but there just literally wasn't the volume. I think the exchanges were surprised. I think they expected people to want to trade it right away and it just didn't happen. Everyone wants to talk about it, but no one actually wants to trade it. So. Well, I saved the last sector for the best sector for the last sector, as far as I'm concerned, because I think this is where there's a ton of opportunity is this is in the softs. So okay. let's start off with uh, the lead dog, as I see it, the price of coffee. What are you thinking? Okay, so. Because I think this is, uh, you know, a very big potential. I, I don't know what happened to the supplies of these things, but it, it could be sure. a COVID situation. I think I was actually just going to say that. So we have um, a relationship with a couple of people in the coffee industry who told us in like the July timeframe that there was issues with harvesting because COVID was kind of 
interfering with the work, like the way the, the harvesting works in South America is the harvesters actually travel and, and harvest along the way, but they were starting to get infected with COVID and they were dropping out. And so there just weren't enough people to, to harvest the, the crop. So we had positioned ourselves here for a bullish move. And guess what? We gave up on it like literally a day before it finally made a move. So mm. that's our bad. But mm. um, I do think that coffee's probably, I mean, you can see uh, this was 2019. We ran from like October all the way up to 145 in December. I wouldn't be shocked if to see something that similar. I don't know if we'll quite see 145, but 135, 140 is definitely doable. Seasonally, this is a bullish time of year for coffee. So I definitely wouldn't want to be short. And it does look like it's fairly, uh, tr fairly nice technically. There was some 105, 110 resistance. It blew out. When it, it came did. back, it held the 110. Right. And so 110 um, is a pretty decent line in the sand, if not 105, huh? Sure. Yeah. So, I mean, if I would love to get in on the long side, I'd love to see it come to, back down to 110, 105 area. Not yeah. sure it'll happen, but if it does, that'd be a pretty comfortable place to try something. All right. Now the sugar broke out above 13, but now it's back under 13. So uh, was that just a sneak job or, you know, do you think it has, uh, has it turned to the tide? Um, my personal get opinion is I think if I'm right about crude oil and crude oil is due for a little bit of a temporary break, it should pull sugar down with it. Sugar's kind of benefited from the ethanol thing okay. and, and yeah. the recovery and all that kind of stuff. So I'm thinking sugar's probably coming back down to about 11 cents is my guess. Yeah. It looks like it, uh, you know, it popped up in, above the resistance, got all the stops. Mm -hmm. And uh, if it uh, does not uh, get its boat legs pretty soon, it probably uh, does look like it might have just been a snake job. Sure. Uh, how about that OJ? OJ's at uh, 121.90 today, up again. And uh, some people are thinking there's some, I, you watch the commitment of traders and all that, right? I do. I watch it pretty closely. Not necessarily in OJ, to be honest. I haven't looked at I that in you. quite a while, but I do watch it. Um, OJ is one of those markets that's also on the thinner side. Right. So if there's a, a good opportunity, um, we definitely are paying attention, but it's there, it's hard to trade the options. The bid-ask spreads wide. And oh, yeah. yeah. So you're, if you can trade them. They're tradable, but you basically you can buy a call or buy a put and that's it. You don't want to do anything fancy because the bid-ask spread will eat you up. So we don't do a whole lot with it, but I do think OJ is probably going to creep back up and test 130, 135, although I wouldn't bet money on it either way. <laughs> what so. about uh, Coco? Uh, I know that's another one that's going to be rough to use options on, but the volatility can be sometimes quite large, right? It is. Coco's a, Coco can be a pretty big mover and the options actually aren't horrible. I wouldn't try to do a butterfly or anything like that on them, but uh, for just buying calls and buying puts are fine. And actually it's, a decent market to use options to hedge. So for example, if you think Coco is going higher, you could go along a futures contract and then maybe buy a put beneath it because the, the options generally aren't that overpriced. They're usually pretty reasonable and the mm -hmm. bid-ask spread's doable. So it's a good market to hedge with options um, if you want to be a little more aggressive and trade the futures outright. I do think we just basically had a big explosion higher. We corrected a little bit. I think we go back up in Coco. I'm thinking like 2,700 or so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The coffee and the cocoa seem like they have the best looking charts so far. They do. And they're still like, they seem expensive because they've had big run-ups, but they're really not. If you, if you look at the long-term picture, uh, yeah, they're yeah, actually very cheap. much. Yeah. 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 I thought under a hundred on coffee was a gift. Um, Absolutely. What about the uh, cotton, the fiber, you know, that used to trade up in the 80, 90, a hundred, it's down in the 50, 60 or whatever it is. Is there, is that a turn going on there? That's, um, so cotton's, that's $500 a point. Tricky. If you get on the right it side is. of $500 a point, yeah. that's not bad. Man. I haven't done much in cotton since like 2000, I think it was 2011. I got caught on the opposite side of like an unbelievable rally. So I really haven't done a whole lot in cotton since, but if I had to take a guess, I would say we'd probably move higher again. It looks like cotton's expensive because of where we've come from, but this is actually pretty cheap. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. This is a monthly chart. Actually, look, yeah, it was 2000, 2011. We had some short calls here and it wasn't, it was a very unpleasant experience. <laughs> Ouch. So, yeah, it hurt. Yeah. But uh, so, I mean, long-term cotton's actually probably a pretty, pretty good deal. If you have the wherewithal to just write it out, you'd probably end up doing pretty well. 
Uh, how about the last one, uh, lumber? It's doubled in price, and uh, they say they can't find it and all that kind of stuff. And uh, um, I, I thought it always traded around 300 or 400, and then I saw it at 754, and I go, wow. I guess that's why Pulte Homes and those are going nuts, huh? Exactly right. And they actually, I have saw a couple news stories on the business stations today about lumber, which tells me we're probably, uh, we're probably <laughs> getting a end. little toppy. Yeah. yeah. And I've had a few clients ask me about it and yeah. that have never traded before. So that's kind of the, honestly, that's kind of the telltale sign that we're probably getting yeah. a little toppy. Lumber's thin. So I wouldn't be shocked to see it kind of squeeze a few more people out, maybe see 700, but I would, I definitely wouldn't try to buy up here. And if you want to try to sell it, um, I mean, just make sure you have plenty of margin because it's gonna, it probably is gonna be wild. Yeah, it's awfully extended from its moving averages though. It is, for sure. Mm -hmm. And this is the RSI, if you can see, we've really, it's pretty rare to see, <laughs> let's see what that is. Infinity? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, it's at 90. It's pretty rare to see an RSI at 90. Um, and it's, I would say, I don't wanna say never, but I don't recall ever seeing an RSI hold up there, so. Well, every uh, sector of investing has its day. And obviously tech and mega cap growth have had many days in the last 90 days. Uh, but I was wondering, can you put up the CRB index? Because my feeling is, is that when we come out of recessions, like if you could go back 20 mm -hmm. years, we could see how we did in 01, 02, 03. Sure. And then of course, out of 08, 09, 10. My feeling is, is that uh, when we come out because they're printing money and they want everything to get going, the commodities can sometimes have a pretty good time of it. Sure. So this this is uh, the Bloomberg Commodity Index. I bring that up because it's actually a tradable contract. Oh, I know okay. some people like this here. It's the same idea, exact same idea. And I happen to have it because we trade it. So I happen to have it up and handy. Um, but you could see that just how cheap we are. We're trading. The, the all-time low was in March, and that was like a little under 60 for the index. And just to give you kind of some perspective, I'm going to roll back all the way to 2011. And this index was at, um, whoops, let me, I have all these notes that have been sitting here for months. Okay, so in 2011, we got up to 175 in that index. So we're talking, we're now at about 60, 60 well, we're about at 70. Um, in 2008, this index, that's, if you remember 2008, crude oil was trading at $150 a barrel, and that's why this commodity index was so high. Is it, it weighted? Was, uh, this is actually not that weighted. It's, I think it's about 20% crude oil, okay. um, maybe even a little less, but it's, it's 22 commodities. It's pretty evenly weighted, but at that time, everything was just flying high. Um, grains, I think corn was in the $8.00. Beans were way, beans were in the teens. So everything was just really expensive back then. And the index was at 240 and now we're at 70. And that's after a pretty big rebound from March. So it just gives you an idea of how cheap commodities are in general. And I think it, I don't think that's gonna last. I mean, you know, you hear all this um, with the Fed printing money and putting it into the economy, how it's affecting gold and silver and stocks well guess what eventually it's going to filter into grains and other things as well and this should go higher do you have any comment on uh, china and the uh, potential purchasing of grains or you think that's off the table till after the election um people just seem to have honestly given up any type of hope mm -hmm. <laughs> and so i think i think if if it does happen i mean obviously they've pledged but they haven't really lived up to their end of the bargain and i think as the relationship gets a little more rocky, I don't think that's even expected, but the reality is the world needs, you know, grains and it needs these types of things to survive. So if China's not gonna buy it from us, eventually all the supply chains will adjust and someone will buy it from us. We're, you know, we have a high quality product and it's cheap. So at some point that'll all correct itself, but it's gonna take a lot of time for, for that to work itself out. If it does come to pass that China does live up to the bargain or buy, decides to buy more or whatever the case is, it should be a really big boost to the market, yeah. but I'm not going to hold my breath. On the CRB index here, um, uh, how uh, much is every point? Like say it's trading at 66 and it goes to 67. How much money is involved? That's a hundred dollars. So this is actually a really, really great contract. I'm going to turn to the monthly chart so you can get an idea of this. Yeah, I wanted to see going back to, if you have it going yeah. back 20 years, at least if you have it back. Uh, this contract years. goes to 2000s about 
So that'll give you a pretty good idea. Let me just delete my notes. <laughs> okay, so this does show you the near 240 and just how low we are. We've kind of bounced off trend line, which is a good sign. Um, the so, red line there yeah. has been uh, holding. Oh. Yeah, and oh, what I was going to mention is that so this is the Bloomberg Commodity Index. It's a futures contract, so it's really an awesome way to get a diversified foot in the door without a whole lot of risk. So to give you an idea, yeah, each point is worth a hundred dollars. So if the index is trading at seventy, that means the the whole index is worth seven grand. So if you buy a contract, if if all commodities go to zero, you lose seven thousand. So you can kind of see there's, I mean, nobody wants to lose seven grand, but it's not like crude oil or something where it's it's a ton of money on the on the line and it's the odds of all commodities going to zero are probably pretty low probably don't shouldn't even mention it right. um the margin on it is only 450 dollars, so mm. it's a really great way for people to get in low stress and have a foot in the door yeah i mean if you're a mutual fund guy and you're uh, asset allocating and all that stuff and you're qualified right. you know yep. this is a way to get the exposure to a sector that uh, is certainly not uh, at a all time high. Right. And uh, yeah. there are some of them, uh, some of the markets that we've shown today that have clearly shown a bit of a turn. Right. Yeah. So. And, and there's leverage in it too. I mean, it's, it, it's manageable leverage. So it's really awesome actually. All right. Well, since these people are generally stock people, let's end up with the S and P and the NASDAQ and, and the Russell maybe, and see what you think on those three items. Okay. So let me, this is a daily chart of the S and P. There's a lot going on. Let me pull up the monthly. And this is kind of what we've been looking at since March. Um, let me scale it here. All right. So we've been kind of ever since the 2016 election, the mar the volatility has actually exploded. People don't realize or kind of pinpoint that that's when the time was, but it really was. If you remember on election night, we had a huge sell off and then the S&P came rallying back. And then it rallied to levels that nobody ever thought were imaginable before finally correcting. But anyway, we've got, since then, we've kind of gone through patterns of irrational exuberance to, and then flipped back to irrational fear. There's been a lot more volatility. The ranges have been bigger. The ups and downs have been scarier. So what we're thinking is uh, the upper end of this megaphone pattern is going to be about 3550, 3600. So that's where we think the S and P is going. Now, do fundamentals support it? That's a whole nother question. But that's probably where we're going. And you think also because of uh, the negative sentiment of traders, uh, you could even get a squeeze to send you up there. I think so. Yeah. Again, um, most. In the futures markets, most specs are short, according to the COT report. And I feel like in the stock market, the buy and holders are probably just enjoying their summer vacation. They care less because mm -hmm. the market's going their way. They have no stress. The mm -hmm. people that are stressing out are the people that have been short or tried to go short or, you know, so the active trading volume is the people that are in trouble, not the, not the buy and holders. Those people are just or love and life. So now some think, people are saying, yeah. uh, Carly, that uh, mm -hmm. there could be a violent rotation out of the NASDAQ into some value. So okay. uh, could we put up the NASDAQ? Do you sure. see a situation where you were just getting into some very rarefied air? Right. So the technical analysis that we use on the S&P that generally works more than it doesn't does not work with the NASDAQ. The NASDAQ just does whatever it wants. <laughs> so this is this is a weekly chart of the NASDAQ. Let me see. I don't really have a monthly drawn up. So, I mean, my guess is we probably, I, everybody's trying to call a top in the NASDAQ and it probably should top, but that doesn't mean it, it will. We yeah. still are seeing just, there's just too many bears. And when everybody thinks the market's going to do one thing, it does the opposite. Um, before the 2016 election, everything just kind of found a way to grind higher. And I think that's probably what we're going to see. Now, what happens election night or after the election, that's a complete crapshoot. I have no idea. Um, but I think the odds are we kind of creep higher up until then. We, we could get a short-term correction. I mean, it's obvious stocks are a little overbought up here, but any correction I think will be shallow and then we go back up. Um, as far as the NASDAQ completely melting down, not sure do you, we're gonna do get you that have, do, you, do you have anything that has a spread? Do you have a spread chart where you would be uh, long S and P, short Nasdaq, or vice versa. Um, is that available? No, not I mean really? I can. Well, I yeah, I can pull up a spread chart. It's not something that I've really done. We had. Let me let me just see. 
Because if there was going to be a violent switch at some point, um, mm -hmm. it would be interesting to see what the relationship is now. Because I would assume the relationship is uh, extended um, on a spread as well. And of course, if you do a spread, you got two things working. Yeah. Working. Uh, so, I mean, it's kind of hard to see on, on a chart like this, but this is kind of how they've moved together. I mean, obviously the NASDAQ is... Um, moving at a faster pace than the S&P, but yeah. I'm not sure. Because they said I mean, in the I last have... 20 years, uh, a value has not lagged behind growth as much in like 20 years or 30 <laughs> years or 100 years or whatever. You know? Right. Yeah. Um, I mean, my personal thought is if we do, I do think that like the S&P and the Dow needs to catch up with the NASDAQ. Mm -hmm. I'm just not sure. The, I don't think I don't believe the Nasdaq's going to fall over, and the other two are going to go higher because they. I just don't. I'm not sure that that's how it would work. I think it would be more like the Nasdaq kind of stabilizes, and the other two creep higher to match. But who knows? That's probably that's probably a more likely scenario. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we are going to come to the top of the hour. So I know you work with both um, self-directed investors as well as you work with assistant, uh, assisted accounts that you can assist. So you want to just briefly explain uh, you know, what people can get uh, by uh, contacting you? Yeah, sure. So um, if you visit our website, decarlytrading.com, you'll find that we offer all kinds of educational material. Again, we are a brokerage service. That's how we make our money. But we want to make sure that anybody that does decide to trade with us knows exactly what they're getting into, what the risks and rewards are, all that sort of stuff. So we have educational videos, articles, all kinds of fun stuff on the website. You can also sign up for a free trial of our newsletters. In the newsletters, we do provide trading ideas, market commentary, guesses on where things might go. Any of the trading ideas that we do offer, we provide a chart, we provide the exact risk reward, and we actually follow it all the way to the end. So. We don't just tell you when to get in and then forget about it. We'll tell you we think you should get in. And then if, when we think it's time to get out or adjust it, we'll also tell you. Can you mention the website on how they could, uh, you know, get on there again? Sure. So it's decarlytrading.com and I'll spell it for you. It's D-E-C-A-R-L-E-Y trading.com. You can also find us on Twitter, hashtag, or I'm sorry, handle is at Carly Garner or uh, Facebook. If you search for DeCarly Trading, you'll find us. Okay, perfect. Uh, Carly, always great to have a conversation. And I think the uh, the people who generally come here and just hear stock, stock, stocks, I think it wouldn't be a bad idea for people that are qualified to uh, learn more about the future sector. And uh, by contacting you, they have that opportunity. For sure. Thanks for having me. Okay, David, back to you. And thanks everybody for attending today. All right, and uh, also just want to let everyone know, um, in case you haven't heard about this yet, uh, on Thursday, we're going to have a big uh, event, uh, day trading, um, it'll be uh, day trading education, day trading strategies. So I have, was it uh, 10 present, or nine presentations lined up. So uh, the option professor will be back to, uh, to open that event at 10 a.m. on Thursday. And um, if you, uh, you can always attend just by going to timingresearch.com slash live and you can get access there. Um, and if you also register for the event, you can, uh, you'll get uh, some preview materials about that as well. So I uh, just wanna thank my guests again for today. Lots of good info, uh, cover lots of, uh, lots of, Good information today. So also just a quick reminder, be sure to subscribe to Timing Research on YouTube and your favorite podcast directory or app. And uh, you'll get updates on these weekly shows as well as the uh, individual presentations of the, the bigger events like the one on Thursday. And I uh, just wanna thank my guests again for today, Carly Gardner of thecarlytrading.com and the option professor of optionprofessor.com. Thanks everyone. Thanks David.